Uh, we have a very distinguished speaker today, uh, Captain Andy Chase, who's managed to work his way up from deckhand to professor of marine transportation at Maine Maritime Academy. How do you do that from <laughs> deckhand? <laughs> the rest of us get as far as skipper on a good day. Um, one of the reasons he's giving his talk is that two of his students were on board Bounty when she sank. Uh, and so obviously his, his talk uh, will centre largely on that. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce Andy Chase. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so what I, what I want to do is actually, I'm not going to talk for very long, you'll be glad to hear. Um, I'm going to give a fairly brief presentation about it just to kind of lay out my thoughts on it. Some of you may have read the article that I wrote for Wooden Boat Magazine this summer, um, and I will have some copies of that uh, to spread around at tomorrow's session, or leave them around. I don't have very many because they're very heavy. Uh, but um, the, what I want to do is kind of lay out my thoughts on the subject, but really I wanted to generate some discussion from you all uh, to see what we can all sort of gather uh, from that tragedy. So. Uh, let me go ahead and give this part, and then um, I'll, I'll, in the meantime, I want you all to be th sort of thinking about what you'd like to say about it or, or hear about it, so thanks. So at first glance, uh, the Bounty tragedy was a simple disaster. One bad decision took a vessel straight into harm's way, and she sank with the tragic loss of two people. But like a lot of disasters, the simple view is incomplete. And if we don't look deeper, we stand to miss the important points that could prevent another similar disaster. In brief, the tragedy unfolded like this. In mid-October, the bounty completed a shipyard period where the yard foreman found what may have been a significant amount of rot in her frames that did not get addressed. There were also several large underwater seams caulked by inexperienced crew and finished with non-marine caulking compounds. On Thursday, October 25th, 2012, the bounty got underway from New London, Connecticut, southbound for St. Petersburg, Florida. Hurricane Sandy, already being dubbed the Superstorm, by the National Weather Service was northbound over the Bahamas and was forecast to continue north and make landfall somewhere in the U.S. northeast coast. The chief mate had expressed concern to the captain about the plan to sail south and had recommended a different plan, to sail to New Bedford, Massachusetts, where there was a hurricane barrier to hide behind. The captain, Robin Waldridge, said no but agreed to the mate's suggestion that the crew be notified of the forecast and given the option to depart the ship. Nobody departed. On Saturday afternoon, October 27th, after motor sailing south and a little east for two days, and having closed the distance to the hurricane by half, the captain decided to turn west across the path of the storm, which was already being felt on board. By 2000 that evening, it was becoming apparent that the bounty was flooding. The bilges were rising. The pumps were not keeping up. They were also not working properly or reliably, as evidenced by the fact that the captain himself was in the engine room working on them for some time, and by the fact that he had activated the emergency backup pumps. All night Saturday and all day Sunday, the crew was in a constant fight against steadily rising bilge water. The ship was sinking slowly but steadily. At some point on Sunday, a sight glass tube on the fuel oil day tank was broken, allowing its fuel to drain out. And this caused the port engine and generator to run out of fuel and die. This was the beginning of a cascade of engine and pump failures due to lack of fuel, clogging filters, and rising water levels in the engine room. When all those engines and pumps were failing to keep up with the rising bilges, an emergency portable trash pump was brought out of storage 
where it had lived for years without ever being tested. It couldn't be made to pump effectively. Finally, at 2030, on Sunday evening, Captain Walbridge asked his home office to contact the Coast Guard, but specifically stated that the vessel was not in distress. At 2230, with the bilges rising at about two feet per hour, he activated the EPIRB, but he told the, the home office to tell the Coast Guard that they should be fine until morning. That kind of confusing communication with the Coast Guard continued for most of the night. Even as the captain ordered his crew into their emergent suits, he was telling the Coast Guard that they should be fine for another six to eight hours. Unfortunately, at about 0430, the crew was pitched into the water as the ship rolled onto her side. Thus began a new nightmare of spars and blocks falling on swimmers, swimmers getting tangled in the rigging, swimmers being dragged underwater or picked up into the air by the rolling ship, and finally, a rescue of heroic proportions by two U.S. Coast Guard helicopters. All but two of Bounty's crew survived. The captain was never found, and deckhand Claudine Christian was found but was unresponsive and pronounced dead on arrival on shore. No one is likely to deny that sailing into a hurricane was a terrible decision. But that is not why the bounty sank. The chief mate, in his testimony to the U.S. Coast Guard Board of Inquiry, said he had been in weather at least as bad, if not worse, on the bounty in the past. She didn't sink because a sight glass on a fuel tank broke. She didn't sink because a seam failed, or because a trash pump wouldn't pump, or because the crew was inexperienced. The bounty sank because a fuel tank sight glass broke in a hurricane when a seam was failing and a trash pump wouldn't pump, and an inexperienced crew could not muster the resources necessary to combat all those problems. And the Coast Guard was not notified in time to get to her with the resources that could have saved her. Any one, two, or possibly even three of those failures may have been survivable. All of them might have been survivable if the U.S. Coast Guard could have delivered pumps to her 12 or 24 hours earlier. But the chain of errors and structural failures compounded each other, and she was overwhelmed. It wasn't that no one saw any of this happening or knew what to do about it. As problems arose, different individuals addressed them to the best of their abilities, and in some cases by heroic efforts. But too many failures were occurring too fast, and the final straw was that the extent of the failures was not appreciated by the captain in time to get the U.S. Coast Guard out there early enough to save her. Fundamentally, the loss of the bounty was the result of a breakdown in bridge resource management. A BRM course or text contains lessons on passage planning, complacency, margins of safety, internal communications, external communications, error chains, situational awareness, and fatigue. The bounty tragedy incorporated breakdowns in every category. At first glance, one would think there must have been an experienced captain, an inexperienced captain, with little respect for or from his crew who had never studied BRM or who didn't believe in it. But that was not the case with Robin Walbridge. Robin was an experienced seaman who had managed a very challenging vessel for many years through all kinds of good and bad situations. He had great respect for his crew and was very fond of most of the people who worked for him. 
He was a natural teacher and ran his ship more like a school than an operation. As a result, his crew was extremely fond of him and treated him with so much respect, even after the accident, that the investigators were baffled by it. He had taken a course in BRM like any other SDCW certified mariner and employed at least some of the techniques that are taught there, such as his pre-departure capstan meetings. This indicates that at least at some level, he understood and believed in the principles of BRM, Bridge Resource Management. Yet somehow, all those lessons of BRM fell by the wayside when Captain Walbridge decided he wanted to head south. No one seems to know why he wanted to go south so badly, but it got in his head, and from then on, he repeatedly made excuses for the decision instead of listening to his officers, listening to the weather, and listening to his ship. I believe that he simply thought that because he had made it through rough weather before, he could do it again. I don't believe it was any more complicated than that. In the BRM model, the ship's officers are supposed to be a part of the planning and preparation process. They provide valuable input to assist the captain with tough decisions. They are encouraged to speak up when they have concerns or see flaws in the plan that the captain may have missed. Yet, to the extent that they did speak up, they were ignored in this case. Why? Without Robin, we can't know, but it seems that he simply got fixated on going. It has happened before, and not only on board ships at sea. In 1977, two 747 airliners crashed on the runway in Tenerife, Canary Islands, when KLM Flight 4805 attempted to take off from a fogged-in runway on which Pan Am Flight 1736 was still taxiing. Twice, the KLM co-pilot informed the captain that they did not have runway clearance from the tower, but did not stop the pilot from starting his takeoff run. With 583 fatalities, it is still the worst airplane disaster in history. In both cases, the ship or aircraft officers felt that things were not going right and spoke up, but the captain did not change his plan. In both cases, the captain was convinced that everything would work out fine, probably just because they always had. In both cases, there was ample information pointing to an unsafe outcome, but even when it was brought to their attention, the captains did not accept it. The breakdowns in the bounty tragedy read like the table of contents of a BRM textbook. Chapter 1, Passage Planning. The captain didn't give his second mate the opportunity to replan the voyage in the context of the hurricane. A second mate had had training in plotting the 1-2-3 rule for hurricane avoidance. He would surely have recommended a different route. Chapter 2, Complacency. The captain told his chief mate that heading out would be fine after the mate had objected to it. He showed the same complacency with respect to the rot discovered in the shipyard, the reduced pumping capacity reported by the crew, and the reports of higher than normal bilge levels at the outset of the voyage. Chapter three, margins of safety. The captain first plotted a course in the general direction of the hurricane, and then altered course to pass even closer to it. His rationale may have been to get to the navigable side of the storm, but his location when he made the decision brought him very close to the storm and across its track and on the side to which it was predicted to turn. Chapter 4, Internal Communications. The captain resisted the request by the mate to start talking to the crew about getting ready to abandon ship, saying he didn't want to alarm them. Good internal communication involves keeping people informed so they can be prepared. As it was, 
The crew knew enough to be talking amongst themselves about the severity of the circumstances, and some were talking about whether they should start taking steps on their own. This led to disorganization and to a disorderly evacuation. Chapter 5, External Communications. The captain waited until the ship was already in extremis before calling the Coast Guard for help. The bilge levels were rising faster than the pumps could handle for at least 24 hours before he called the Coast Guard. At this time, the wave heights were about 15 feet plus, with winds of 20 to 40 knots. That compares to the conditions when the actual rescue took place, when conditions included seas of 30 feet and in winds in excess of 90 knots. In the former conditions, the rescue may have been 100% successful or they may have even been able to deliver enough pumping capacity to keep the vessel afloat. And all of these demonstrate the development of the air chain, compounded by a loss of situational awareness, exacerbated by fatigue. So how do we take what we have learned in bridge resource management classes and use it so we don't find ourselves in a similar situation? We, encourage, we engage all the ship's officers to plan the voyage to ensure that the plan is thorough. We build in ample margins of safety and we don't violate them unnecessarily. We communicate our plan and safety measures to all on board. We arrange for a reliable communications link to someone who can keep track of our status and report us to the Coast Guard if an emergency should occur. We manage our crew's duty schedules to preserve their energy to the extent possible so they have the clarity of mind to keep their situational awareness up, which helps everyone on board spot an error chain as it's developing. And we listen to our crew when they express concern. We drive complacency away by remembering the accidents that have happened to others and believe that they can happen to us. We have to stop thinking of bridge resource management as a certificate and turn it into a conversation. It must be employed actively, not passively, and it can't work if the mates are pushing it up from below, it can only work if the captain is pulling it up from above. Once you really believe that a bad thing can happen to you, you should be glad to have two or three others helping you with the plans to avoid it and keeping an eye out for it starting to happen. The worst thing we can do is to simply blame Robin for the tragedy because that allows us to write it off as something that won't happen to us. He did something stupid. I'll never do that. End of story. When I taught casualty analysis at Maine Maritime Academy, that's a study of casualties involving the rules of the road, I would start the first lecture by pointing out to the students that in every casualty they read, they would probably find themselves saying, wow, that was stupid. I would then ask them to think back to the last time they did something really stupid. None of us has to look far. We all do it, even when we know better. That's why we need to listen to our bridge team when they say, Captain, should we consider heading south, east, sorry, instead of south? Thank you. So what I'd like to do is, taking that as a starting point or not, um, have some discussion here about to what level you are using bridge team management uh, principles on board your vessel, formally or informally, or are not, um, and uh, you know, how any, any experiences where it has uh, been effective or perhaps not been effective, um, something of that nature. Um, I think it's worth keeping in mind that Captain Walbridge 
attended conferences of both the American Sail Training Association, as it was then called, and STI. He participated in them. He could have been sitting in this room if the accident had happened to someone else, shaking his head and wondering, what on earth was that captain thinking? So we need to talk about this and learn something from it so that it doesn't happen to us next. I just have a couple of questions to sort of get the, uh, the conversation started, but it can go anywhere. Um, I think it's important that we all kind of process it, and, and um, I think we all process it by hearing others process it. So let's see what we can get from it. Um, and I guess what I'd first like to do is just say, how many in this room um, use a BRM-inspired formal or somewhat formal, but not totally informal, somewhat formal version of a BRM pre-passage meeting process as taught in a BRM class. How many people use that on board their vessel? So that's, you know, it wasn't that long ago that I presented a talk about bridge resource management at STI in, I can't remember if it was in Barcelona or one of the uh, conferences, it wasn't that long ago. And it was a new topic to the sail training community, um, relatively. And people were, were beginning to talk about it. So we've come a long way. And um, I think you know, there is a lot of this process going on. And I have to repeat myself to say that if Robin was here, I think his hand would have gone up. But clearly, there was some kind of a disconnect there. Um, so if anybody wants to start off um, either by talking about the process they do use on board or a particular example or something like that, I'd, I'd like to get it going on that score. And we do, by the way, we are being filmed, so we would like people to talk into the microphone. Uh, and the sound man has asked if you would really hold the microphone up to your mouth, not down here somewhere, uh, so that they can get it recorded. Sure. Uh, should I present myself as well? Yeah, yeah, Alan please. I'm Palmer. I'm uh, captain of a deck owner, a uh, brig, wooden brig. And I've signed some 10, 15 different uh, wooden ships, mainly. Uh, I would like to take one, one thing that you haven't mm -hmm. mentioned, and that is in the sailing ship community there is quite a lot of romance. And uh, one thing that I, I read that he, he said before leaving was a ship is safer at sea than a, um, a ship is safer at sea, mm -hmm. which is a very, very old fashioned statement. Mm -hmm. And I think that this, this romance part of, of our job separates us a bit, a bit from, the, from what you learn in Merchant Navy. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, also that this, this extremely, this, this loyalty from the crew is also perhaps something you find more in the sailing ship community than you would find in the, in the Merchant Navy. Uh, so I think we have, to, we, have to accept, we have to accept that that is part of our job also, mm -hmm. being a bit romantic. That's right. And you have to, have to be aware of it when when you assess these, these different problems. And that's a very valid point. Um, you can keep that out. I've got, my job is to stand closer to this one here. Um, and I would point out, uh, many of you have read uh, Captain Dan Parrott's book, uh, Tall Ships Down, maybe all of you. Um, and I think he points out in there, I'm pretty sure it was in one of those chapters, that he talks about the fact that um, the uh, vessel was being chastised. I think it was the, um, uh, I think it was the Maria Sumpta was being chastised for grandstanding, for sailing close to the cliff there where she ended up. And he said, you know, that's kind of what we do. That's our whole job, is grandstanding. I mean, the stuff, you know, we never want to sail out of sight of land. We always want to be, you know, carrying full sail right up into the port in the harbor. And that's, that is pretty much what we do. So the romance part is inextricably connected to our job. Um, but our job, as the officers, is to find that line and perhaps keep them separated, perhaps keep the romance public and keep the formal professional part of it amongst the officers and the crew so that we're running a safe operation as well. And, um, somebody. Uh, Chris Blake, there's a 
a lot of complacency. On, I've been on ships with permanent crew who've been there for a long time. You might begin in the first briefing saying, this is what we're going to do, this is what we're going to do. But after a while, that goes by the board because you know, or you think you know, the crew know what you're going to do. Uh, and that's the complacency side of it. Mm -hmm. So you get, they get used to your ways as a captain. And so they work around it. And that can be very dangerous mm -hmm. because things might change during a maneuver, just coming alongside, for instance. And you do wind changes or ship goes past you, whatever you're trying to do while you're trying to park it. And things are the ordinary. That's when accidents happen, is when you go away from the norm. But I think a lot of it is because you, you have a crew, a mate, second mate, bosun, and watch leaders who are used to one way of doing it. And when it changes, that's the dangerous part. That also is a key. I mean, that is a characteristic of the sailing industry versus the motor vessel industry. The, the merchant ship industry, they lay a track line down, they follow the track, and they get there when they say they're going to get there. And, and we do everything except that. <laughs> and, and we know, you know, we have to plan for the unplanned. We know that things are going to go differently than the plan. So somehow that has to be incorporated in the plan. Is that The plan is a, is a set of parameters, not a course and track line sort of thing, so, um, but I think maybe the piece of that is communications, is making sure that everybody's talking to you as the captain, telling you that the plan is, you know, that, that the circumstances have changed and therefore the plan is changing. And at some point, maybe it makes sense to have another meeting, maybe it's a, just a quick exchange of information like a watch relief, but uh, yeah. yeah, we know the plan is gonna change, maybe Mike. Thanks. I'm, I'm going to suggest that in the room there's probably violent agreement that bridge resource management is a good thing and that we all ought to do more of it. And if we do more of it, we're likely to have fewer problems of the kind that we've been talking about. Uh, but, even, but recognizing that, I think we'll all probably be inclined to agree that the Scatinos we're always going to have with us, even so. And so there's a limit, just because of human nature, on how much can be achieved through exhaustive and complete use of tools like bridge resource management. That's not to take away from the desirability of going forward as you've described. But the example relating to the 747s at Tenerife, uh, I, I believe is very instructive, and I've been mentioning it to other people, and I'm gratified to see that you, that you made use of the same uh, example, because my understanding is that out of that casualty in the aviation industry, there has arisen certain elements that, in effect, put limits on the absolutism of the aircraft commander's power. In other words, that there are things in the nature of a subordinate's veto in favor of safety. and. We've all grown up with the concept of the master as the master uh, under God with, with very little in the way of limits other than those imposed by governments. But I believe that, for, for one thing, I think that as the, as the final reports about the bounty come out, there may be people outside of our industry who start to raise the question, hey, maybe there should have been a mutiny on the bounty. Uh, that's a tough position to have that chief mate be in. That's the whole premise of the Kane mutiny. Uh, and it it's, tends to make us shiver to our core. But I think it's appropriate to start to consider whether there are certain things in the nature of a subordinate's veto in the direction of safety. And one example that occurs to me is an ability on the part of, let's say, the mate to have uh, taken steps to, to communicate to the Coast Guard that the view of, that, that, that the, if you will, a complacent view of the master was not shared by all on board. And, and that, while that would certainly be uh, not supportive of the dignity of the master, might have saved a lot of lives. And the, the, we could have sensible management if there were opportunities akin to what I've just illustrated that would, that would allow actions to be taken when there's still time for something to result from them uh, th that 
could have made a pretty significant difference. The answer won't be uh, soon or apparent or obvious, but I think that we need to, to, to take more lessons from that uh, 747 disaster uh, that really re-examine the whole nature of the way we've, we've conceived of command. You bring a couple of really good points. Um, and first of all, for anybody that hasn't studied that Tenerife disaster, uh, you should realize that that captain was their senior captain, uh, the KLM's senior mass captain, and he was the one responsible for safety training in the organization. So he knew better. And, and, and my, my understanding is the, the, the institutional culture within the airline was such that uh, it was very forbidding to cross the halls of that individual. In other words, you, it was very much not career enhancing to be in a position of looking like an upstart in the face of an individual with that much power. Yeah. And that's a big deal when the individual with that much power is marching down a, a path of disaster. Uh, and, and that, I mean, nothing's going to work if there isn't a mutual respect amongst the officers and the captain. I mean, the captain has got to make the tough decisions. That's why you hire that person. That's why they're there. And that's why we don't, in fact, have navigation by democracy. So on the one hand, I would shudder at the thought of a third mate calling the Coast Guard while I was not on, in their presence <laughs> and saying, you know, I, I think this is going screwy here. Um, yeah, sure, in retrospect, it, the, the lowliest deckhand should have called the Coast Guard in this circumstance, but that's easy to say in, in hindsight. Um, so I think that's where the, group, the meeting is so important, because at the meeting, you are offering an opportunity for the subordinates to speak up and provide their input. But you're still preserving not just the dignity, because who cares about the dignity if, if it's a life you're in, involved with, but you're preserving the authority of the master in that uh, thing. There's another topic that I would bring up if we, if we end up having time, and maybe somebody else wants to start down that road, but, and that is the whole risk management model. Uh, but that's a topic all its own. I mean, that, that's hours of talk right there, but, but that's another piece of that thing. So, um, sure, down front. Um, yes, uh, Stephen Gosling from the Nautical Institute. Um, I recently completed a piece of research on the effectiveness of human behavior training. And whilst it's um, heavily skewed to practice in the Merchant Navy, which is my background, I spent 10 years working on um, cruise ships. Um, what we're talking about, bridge resource management, and, and some of the elements you've, you've touched on are com completely um, um, transferable. Um, it strikes me that good BRM uh, practice is a practice. It's not a five-day course. It's a mindset. It's a culture that needs to develop. That takes time. It takes money. It takes commitment. It takes effort. And it doesn't happen overnight. And you need commitment from the top. And when we say the top, I would extend it from beyond the master to the offices ashore. The, the master reports to a president or some sort of manager ashore. And they need to be behind it as well. They need to be aware of, of what this is about and why it's important. I'd even go so far as to say they need to attend the course themselves to understand what it is we're trying to achieve on board. Um, when I was at sea, we had a number of incidents that, were, uh, th that started to occur in our fleet where ships were heavily listing uh, and passengers were being injured. Um, we had uh, knocks and bangs in ports. And we had some, very, some fairly cavalier attitudes within the fleet amongst the masters, these long-serving, highly experienced um, masters. And something was going wrong. And so the presidents and the vice presidents ashore got together and said, what is happening? What, what's going wrong here? Why are these incidents occurring? All of the officers are STCW qualified. They've all sat the BRM courses probably much like the officers on the Costa Concordia, but we're still having these incidents. And when they looked at it and they started boiling it down, it was a culture of practice. There were some pretty um, cavalier attitudes, as I say at sea, some fairly insular captains that it was my way or the gangway attitude. 
And so the response and the strategy from the company was to get the most senior captains in the fleet, in other words, those that were most highly respected amongst the captains, and they were pulled out of service, and they became coaching captains, and they were sent um, around the fleet as coaching captains to instill new norms, new values, new practices. And the company were able to bring in aviation experts that, um, that had years and years of experience uh, in that industry and start to change the culture and start to change the practice that we um, were following in our company. And of course, this wasn't an overnight thing. This took many, many years, and they're still in, engaged in the program now. Um, but it's working, and they've got metrics to show that if you do commit to it, and it does come from the top, um, and you do do refresher training, you do reinforce the behaviors on board, you know, you do have um, those measures in place, it does work. So you just need to get it right. As, yes, from the top. It's got to be from the top. And, and for that, a captain has to, I mean, I think we could all safely say that being a captain is a bit of an ego boost, and somehow you've got to quell the ego of the captain. The captain has got to be willing to draw that information out from the, from the subordinates. And most people do. Oh. Thank you, Andy. Paul Bishop. Um, just, it's really following on from Stephen's point, actually. I'd known the bounty for some time, but was never very sure of its operational structure. So who was Robin accountable to, to ensure that good practice and culture of bridge resource management uh, was, you know, carried out on board? God. <laughs> Robin was his own boss, and, and there are probably maybe some of you that are running your own vessel, and um, you know he hired himself. Um, the, that, and that was part of a whole another discussion about crisis response planning was that when it all came to pieces, the woman in the office ashore was really an administrative assistant. She had no idea what she was up against, and um, there was not a structure behind him. And, uh, doesn't mean you shouldn't run your own vessel, I don't think, but we need to think about what does that mean? What does that imply if you are running your own vessel? Yeah. That was, I mean, that, that's, that was a piece that a lot of people knew about the bounty was that she did it her own way, and I say he really did it his own way. I mean, he, you know, the bounty was a very insular organization, and, and uh, there was criticism before this event that, that um, people were kind of locked into the bounty and weren't getting out there and getting the, the kind of feedback that the rest of us get by moving around and moving between organizations and competing for these jobs. So, you know, there, there was a bit of a recipe going on there. Yeah. What about risk management? Does anybody practice a formal risk management process? I mean, the one that I've witnessed was the, when I went on Eagle, the Coast Guard Bark Eagle. Uh, the Coast Guard has a very formal uh, risk management protocol called the GAR assessment model, green, amber, red. There's a crew meeting, um, all the department heads, not crew, officers, uh, department heads get together and everybody sort of throws in a number. Uh, about the state of readiness of their department, the state of um, training or fatigue amongst their, their personnel, uh, the condition of the, their, the gear that they're responsible for, uh, the weather, the route, the, the mission, you know, all those things get assigned a number, all those numbers go into a pot, and that comes out with a green, an amber, or a red. And, and if that comes up amber, that means you've got some things that you can that you need to, t to take care of or, or cushion uh, to make it a say to get it into a green zone. If it comes up red, you're really not supposed to go until you have corrected enough of those things to get back into the safe zone. Um, I was highly impressed by that, um, by the efficiency of it. It was simple, it was quick, uh, it wasn't cumbersome or, or you know, lofty and weighty and, and difficult. Um, does anybody use a system that's any version of that or something like it? Yeah. Good. 
bring him the mic. <laughs> Yeah, um, I'm from Spirit, New Zealand, um, and we we don't use numbers, um, mm -hmm. but we certainly have a chat um, mm -hmm. before um, with the briefing just with the permanent crew, mm -hmm. um, and make sure that everyone has everything they need to carry on, and make sure that the, the, everybody's finished their briefings they needed to get done before we depart, mm -hmm. um, and that's done two hours before departure, so there's still time to or schedule departure, uh, so we still have time to correct anything um, should there be anything need correcting, mm -hmm. um, but we don't put a a number value on it. We just have a, a sit-down chat yeah. um, before we go. Yeah. I mean, I don't think it needs numbers necessarily. Although numbers give an interesting, uh, they, they raise the stakes a little bit. You really do have to commit to something to say. Nah, you can't just say, "Oh, good, be all right." You got to say, "Well, no, I'm like uh, five out of 10. So, whoa, well, you know, what makes it five out of 10? Is there something we can do to get that up to an eight or a nine? Um, so uh, I was impressed by that. Now, having said that, I'm not running a boat myself now. I'm teaching running a desk. But, but you know, with our sail training vessel, the Bowdoin, we don't have a formal model like that. But everybody has talked about it. Um, you know, that's, that's, it's been a bit of a conversation. I won't say it's been a formal conversation either, but there has been that conversation. And so I think there is that flavor kind of occurs amongst the crew. But I think if you asked one of the mates on the Bowdoin, do you do a risk assessment, assessment, they would probably say, no, I don't think we do. But I think the, the captain runs the show in that manner, which is probably what you're all thinking, I'm guessing, that you, you do it in a different way. Is there, is there reason to start trying to shape one of these models to fit what we do? I'd be interested to get a sense. Mike, can we get the mic? The mic to Mike. Uh, Mike Moreland from Picton Castle. There's something that uh, I always remind myself is that, you know, these ships, although they are commercial venture, we're not moving oil around the world. So they're actually, the schedule is never, in my mind, have to be firm and, uh, you know, concrete. I always feel that there is always the option to delay uh, departure, delay an arrival for whatever reason. Um, and that's kind of the culture that we have on board the ship is, you know, we're, we're kind of notoriously late uh, to, for our dates. For anybody trying to meet the ship, we're, you know, routinely late. Our departures are routinely late because we never feel, we never let ourselves feel the pressure to, you know, rush a departure if there's a reason not to leave that day, like you've been working, been rigging all day, or the crew's tired, we don't leave. And we'll just we'll leave tomorrow morning. Um, and we also have another rule, we don't really like to leave unless it's for a tall ship race or something. We don't leave after two, two in the afternoon. We like to leave mid-morning. Um, and I think it's a luxury that, you know, these, we're not, we don't always have this luxury um, when we're doing schedules and tall ship events, <clears throat> but most of the time we do. Um, it's something that I, has kind of always served us well uh, to keep that in the back of our, our, in the front of our minds is that, you know, there's always, if there's a reason not to go or to delay, we have that luxury to use it. So. Yeah, the um, training ship State of Maine, you know, our academy's training ship is, does very much the same thing, you know, Arrival in port, it's always going to be 0800. <laughs> and departure, it's always going to be around noon um, or, or sometime in the morning. It's a, for the exact same reason. It uh, makes, makes everything easier. But, Elliot. Yeah, yeah Elliot Rappaport. Uh, I was actually thinking about this myself. Uh, I'm currently working as a master at uh, Sea Education Association uh, in the U.S. And uh, I used to tell students' parents by way of reassurance that uh, one of the things that our vessels have going for them in the realm of safety is that, you know, we're not going to catch fish, we're not going to deliver cargo, so the, uh, the pressures on schedule uh, are much less than for commercial vessels. But I don't say that anymore because, you know, casualties like this one and some others have made me reflect on the fact that there are pressures and in some ways they're much more insidious because obviously, you know, Robin got underway for some reason unknown. Um, I think he was feeling pressure to move the ship. 
Um, and there have been other casualties in the sail training industry where the same thing, you're aware that something, something led a master to make a decision about departure or about route um, that was guided by some, some pressure. And what, what, whether that was a result of poor communication between the ship and the organization about how important it was for a ship to be somewhere, um, or you know, whether it was just the pressure of expectations, either at a destination or of the crew or of the, the body of trainees, uh, I think these pressures do exist in this industry, um, and I think in some ways you've got to look more carefully for them because they're not always the same. It's not always, oh, we've got to stay out here till the fish hold is full, or we got to get to this dock, uh, or we're going to lose it, we're gonna be able, not going to be able to unload our cargo. So I think, um, as I said, I think the pressures exist, but they're harder to spot, and I think that's one of the continuing challenges of trying to put together a good, whether you want to call it BRM or risk management, um, putting this package together for sail training vessels, I think that's a, that's a challenge. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, the insidious nature of it, I think you have a good point there, is that maybe we have pressures, but we don't, they're not as obvious um, as cargo and, and such. Um, and sometimes we may not even appreciate ourselves that we're feeling that pressure. I, I wonder if Robin would have told us what that pressure was or if he would have said, I don't know, I just you know, seemed like we ought to get going or something. I don't know. Um, that's one of the things that kind of appeals to me to the, about uh, the risk management model that's a little bit more formalized is that, okay, we've got this pressure, insidious or not, you know, this is our schedule, this is when we're going to depart. Two hours before departure, everybody gets together and throws down a number, and then suddenly everybody goes, oh, wait a minute. You know, we're, we're operating in the, in the amber zone here. What is the reason why we're departing? You know, is it, do we in fact have that pressure? Uh, well, we've got to get off the dock. Well, okay, can we go to the anchorage somewhere? Can we, you know, hop around the corner to another sheltered place and hang out there for the night or something? You know, maybe there's, uh, as soon as, as, soon as the, the actual risk has been assessed, then it gets balanced against the need to go or the gain to be gained from going. And, and furthermore, once you've assessed the risk, you probably now have a work list that you need to use to get ready to go um, that maybe you didn't have before you started it. Seems like it would, I, I don't know, it, so it sounds to me like, it feels to me like a risk assessment model could be shaped, and maybe it doesn't even need to be changed. Maybe that model can work. I don't know. I haven't gotten dug down into it that deeply. But it seems to me that it would be worth trying it. Um, and maybe it would be another conversation to have in a year or so to see who has messed around with it and see you know, whether it's working for them. Might be a nice proactive thing to take on. Anybody else? Any thoughts on that? Is that are people recoiling from that idea? I mean, sometimes these things turn into a monster that gets shoved down our throats from above or from somebody else who has a different agenda. But it strikes me that it might be worth taking on. I don't know. Yeah. Can I just ask one since I have the yeah. microphone anyway? Um, I was wondering whether my experience of talking to skippers who've had accidents, they, there are two types. One who say, I made a terrible mistake. <clears throat> and the others who say, oh, well, this happened and this happened, which, you know, I couldn't really, you know, it's sort of all built up and and uh, all started falling apart, and it wasn't really their fault in some kind of way. Where, where, where do you think this captain comes into that? I don't, I, I, I don't know. I knew Robin, but not well. Um, I'd only met him a few times, so I, I can't guess. Um, so I can't answer you directly, but I do know that you're exactly right. There are two, two kinds of people, and then a lot of people that land in between. But, there's the people who always blame someone else and then the people that always blame themselves. Well, usually it's not, usually both of those are wrong. It's not, you know, it's, it's usually not one problem that happened. It's usually a convergence of things. And, um, and that's one of the things that they say to be very careful about if you are involved in an accident is don't either blame yourself or others. Just shut up. <laughs> because you don't know. You know, you don't know. Even though you saw it happen, you don't know until it has been analyzed. And uh, you can say, yes, a terrible accident happened, but don't say, boy, I, really, I made a really terrible mistake, because that'll be the story from then on. Um, so it, it's, uh, uh, I, can't, I can't help wondering you know, whether Robin just decided he couldn't, he couldn't get through that one and, and stayed on board of his own 
desire. Um, I think we probably all wonder that. Um, because he had to, at some point, realize that he had made a terrible, terrible mistake. Yeah. Um, Barry Cork, uh, Road and Sailing Project. I'm um, the director of the, of the project. Um, looking at it, and you know, you should never sail of the dead, but <clears throat> it strikes me as you have a vessel that went to sea with what appears to be rotten timbers um, and corking skilled jobs done by amateurs with material which was not to spec, mm -hmm. which rather drives me towards there was not enough money to run that vessel. Mm -hmm. Now, that, <clears throat> as a master, um, maybe, you know, perhaps you shouldn't work for people who don't have money, mm -hmm. but is it in the, sale, in the sale training world, we are all, you know, all uh, looking at, at our cash flow. Um, it's a matter of, did that start it? the fact that this vessel was underfunded? Um, certainly uh, that was no question that was an issue. I think probably we could all say that nobody, uh, none of us has enough money. Um, on the other hand, um, there was a lot of criticism that the bounty was, uh, you know, under maintained. By the same token, she was also in better shape than she'd ever been. And in fact, um, she visited Castine, visited the academy uh, just to, just before she went to the shipyard, just before this took place. And um, that was my first walk around on her, uh, where I'd spent any time on board and really looked around a, a bit and got the cook's tour. And I had to say that although there was still, you know, I still came away with a feeling of an operation that was a little marginal, um, I could see the amount of work that had been done and could see that it was all going in the right direction. You know, he was really trying to bring that vessel up to snuff and it felt, and he was talking that way too. And the, the mates were all feeling very positive about, you know, this has really come a long way. You know, it's, and I, we know this was a rickety operation for a long time, but boy, it's really come together now and we've got some good people here. And, and um, so it, it seemed like he was working towards the right end. Uh, and then maybe that, maybe that's where he was overconfident. Maybe that's where he felt like, yeah, t ship's tougher than she's ever been. And I've made it through bad stuff before. So now I'm really, now I can really get close to this hurricane. I don't know. We, we can't really know, I don't think. Uh, Mike. Well, I think a fact that gets overlooked sometimes in kind of assessing is Robin's decision to sail into the storm was that he served for a number of years uh, on offshore supply vessels in very, very rough weather. He had a high threshold to, to severe weather, to extreme weather, um, and, and by all reports have, had been in a number of hurricane force storms. Um, so I think that, you know, I think he just had a very high threshold for these yeah. things where, you know, a lot of other skippers, we try, you know, try to avoid these situations. Maybe he viewed it, maybe he didn't view it as, maybe he viewed it as exciting or something. I don't know, you know. Because, yeah. um, I mean, he deliberately went into this, and I think, as you said, it, I think it's just as simple that he thought the ship could take it, and she couldn't. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's, um, certainly uh, he seemed to thrive at least on telling the sea stories about the rough conditions and, and, and throughout all of those, the ship was in much worse condition. So clearly he felt, uh, I think it's probably is true that he felt tougher than ever. Um, somebody asked me if I would have done something like that and I, my reaction was instantaneous. It's like, no, of course I wouldn't have done that. I'm a coward. I'm not, I don't want to go chasing storms. I don't want to get anywhere near them. Um, but, um, but some people do, yeah, some people thrive on it. And, and, you know, I mean, vessels still are, you know, there's boats headed around Cape Horn now. People want to go and, and test themselves and, and uh, want to see it, you know, want to really get the, the full-on experience. So at what point do you know that your vessel is ready for that? And what point do you know your crew is ready for that? That's, that's what's important then, is how to, how to find that. Peter. <laughs> um, so just sort of going back um, to the start with um, the bridge resource management, um, we had an incident um, well before uh, my time with the trust 
um, back in 95, 96, uh, where the ship uh, actually ran aground and she was on the beach for a couple of days. Um, and basically from that moment on, um, it's written in our standing orders that if any one of the crew um, has a problem with uh, the plan, uh, whether it be the voyage plan, passage plan, or the daily activity plan, uh, they can um, go to the master or the mate. Um, and if the master or the mate can't satisfy that, to that person that what they're doing is safe and the right thing to do, uh, then we don't do it. Um, and I've seen that used uh, more than once. Mm -hmm. um, once uh, it was myself to a captain, and I've also had it um, the other way around where people have come to me and said, I don't think this is right, um, and I've either reassured them or said, OK, let's do it some other way. Um, mm. And that, that was all lessons learnt from an incident we had um, in, our, in our history. Um, and that was um, through the court case that was blamed on the master and the mate uh, mm. who didn't get on together. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Just purely yeah, uh, personal reasons, I suppose. Yeah, um, I've, I've heard of uh, that as a, as a practice where everybody gets a wild card. And you can play it if you need to, you know, and, and it has to be, it has to be acknowledged whether or not it can, whether or not you can actually stop the ship or not. I don't know, and that's be different for different circumstances, different vessels, different people. But um, does that apply? How how far down the ladder does that apply? Is that amongst the officers? Is that amongst uh, the deckhands too, or does it does that get a little gray? Um, I guess it gets a little gray. Yeah. I'd been a cadet on board for 15 months. Mm -hmm. I'd been to school for about five weeks, um, and I'd just come back uh, to be employed as the third mate bosun, um, which was a not required on the ship. It was sort of an extra position um, created for ex-cadets. Um, but then the second mate was fallen ill um, during the first day of the voyage, so he actually went home. So I got pumped up, had the qualification, but never done it before. Um, so I was very much the um, the newbie on the block, I suppose, uh, going up against the captain who had 35 years in the industry. Um, How'd that go for you? <laughs> yeah, not necessarily the best thing to do for my career, I suppose. Um, yeah. Yeah. But basically, I'd, I had done 15 months on board. Um, I'd been to the area a lot of times in, during that spell. Mm -hmm. I'd sailed with three or four other masters as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd never once seen any other captain take the ship where he wanted to take the ship. Mm -hmm. um, and OK, I've been in that bay before, um, but never in the bay uh, with 26 to 28 other vessels anchored at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, the bay is only just big enough for us to turn around without the aid of a bow thruster. Um, he wanted to stay the night in there, and we couldn't turn around without the bow thruster because of all the other yachts. Mm -hmm. um, so I refused to drop anchor. Mm -hmm. um, I said, no, I'm not, not happy here. Um, and he did. He moved out. Um, he wasn't happy about it. Um, however, since then I have sailed with him um, numerous times since, mm -hmm. um, and we have the greatest respect for each other. Um, yeah. I think I was probably the first person to ever stand up to him. Mm -hmm. um, and I think since then he's probably, between the two of us, we've probably got a mutual understanding now um, that we talk open about just about anything. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And although it wasn't very good at the time, it took a few weeks to get over, I think. Um, sure. And it's probably really hard for him to swallow and the fact I, that somebody at my age was sure. telling him, yeah. I, th I think that there's, it's, if, if you are the subordinate and you do kind of throw down your veto, um, I think you have to realize that that may have ramifications. It's inevitable, I think. I mean, you know, it, takes a, it, it would take a very, very, well, a very confident master to be able to accept that without reacting. Um, but for that, we need to train the mates to be able to do that. We need to train them. We need to... We need to train the mates and the captains. The, that needs to be a conversation. To, you need to get to a point of mutual respect and tools that allow you to object without just standing out on deck stamping your feet. You, it's got to be something that allows you to make, uh, lodge a formal complaint that has to be respected, but without making a circus out of it. And you, know, it, it, you probably don't want to do that out on the main deck in front of all the students and the crew. Yeah, I mean, um, I wasn't going to stamp right. my foot either. Um, right. I walked up to him quietly and whispered in his sure. ear. Sure. Um, and I think if I had made a scene, uh, the outcome would have been very different. Exactly. Um, sure. Yeah. So you've got and actually, um, I've learned just in a couple of days ago, in fact, I just learned that uh, the, the chief mate on the bounty, John Svensson, had sailed on the Eagle 
a month and a half prior to the disastrous voyage and had expressed great interest in the whole green, amber, red risk assessment model and thought that was really interesting and really might be valuable. And it sounds like he might have tried to sort of do something like that, you know. He was, he objected to the captain. He said, I, I don't think we should do, I don't think we should sail. I think we should go to New Bedford. And the captain said no. And then he said, well, I think we should talk to the crew and tell them that we're doing this. There's a whole other conversation is, you know, when you have trainees on board, volunteers, people with no experience, and you give them an option to get off the vessel, that's not realistic. They, they don't have any tools to decide whether they should be getting on or off the boat. The, the, you've got to, you know, the, you, the experienced people have got to make that decision, not them. So there was a lot of layers of, a lot of layers to this onion. <laughs> yeah. Elliot. I think, I sense that we're sort of circling around the idea that since a lot of institutions in the sail training world aren't that large and really don't have the organizational leverage to create a structure for this sort of thing that is, you know, as, as captains or as, as crew members, it seems like it's, it's important to think about creating a culture where this sort of thing is possible, just, you know, even without having, even if you don't have a formal system in place to make sure that, to, to use whatever tools you do have available to make sure there's an understanding that, um, you know, the people, further up in the hierarchy on the ship need to hear about things that don't look right to uh, the more junior crew. And just people make sure that you know, the door is open and whatever metaphor you want to use that, that there is some sort of mechanism for this. Because I think you know, a lot of uh, sail training organizations are you know, just a few people. Um, and uh, you can't really build a bureaucracy to manage this from above, but um, sort of in the industry to, to recognize that this is probably the healthiest way to run a ship if you're trying to to head off bad decisions and make it really a, a team team effort to do so. Yeah, yeah. Um, the deckhand um, that had been a student of mine who had just recently graduated with less than a year out of school, um, and she was um, on board. Um, she was very eager to get back on the water again. She really wanted to get back on the horse, so to speak. And and um, as soon as she felt she could, she signed on board another vessel. And I'll leave the names out of it, but um, you know, she found herself on another vessel and started seeing the same pattern. Um, now it was clear to her. You know, suddenly it was crystal clear what was what she'd walked into it was another operation that was, and it, things were going the same way. There was a potential reversal of command problem there, where the chief mate had much more experience than the captain did. The captain was a little unsure of himself, and the chief mate was very sure of himself, and. Suddenly, you know, there was conversations like, you know, well, I'm not sure we should go. You know, the captain's saying, well, I don't know if we should do it this way. And the chief mate said, oh, it's all right. Don't worry. I'll be on watch. You know, I'll take care of it. And, you know, oh, my God. And, and, and issues, you know, structural safety, gear issues that she was, she was so keyed in. She knew. I mean, the minute she got on board that boat, she went around and looked at all the seacocks, looked at all the damage control pugs, looked at all the life jackets. You know, she did all this stuff of her own because she felt like she couldn't go to sea again until she knew that things were good. And um, she started calling Rick and myself and telling us what was going on on board. And we, we didn't want to make the decision for her, but boy, we, we knew what decision we wanted her to make. Um, and we kept sort of just kept letting her talk. And finally, she did get off. She was a third mate, and that prevented the ship from sailing. Um, and and you know that damaged her chances with that company. But we said, you know, for the future, they're, they're not likely to hire her again. But we told her, that's a good thing. <laughs> you did you did the right thing. <laughs> you, know, you did the right thing. And uh, and she found herself on another vessel, where um, another small sailing vessel, where again, she found issues. And the captain was instead of appreciating her experience and what she knew now. Um, and her level of commitment to the safety on board, instead of appreciating all that, the captain was annoyed and said, you know, why do you keep trying to piss me off, you know, kind of stuff. And she did stay with that vessel, and she, you know, st stuck with it and, and did her best to improve the conditions on board, and, and she did get her first trip in around Cape Hatteras again. So she sailed out past the site of the sinking and felt like she conquered something there. So she's off and running, I think. 
but you know, when you do speak up, it may not be without damage to your circumstances. I think you've got to be tactful and strong. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. I think perhaps one of the problems was that the captain in this particular vessel didn't have to answer to anybody else. He was the answer. Right. Uh, and that is very dangerous. Mm -hmm. you, you, can, you, you may be captain under God, but there's got to be somebody else that's a little bit more godly than you are. Mm -hmm. Just a DP, dedicated mm -hmm. person ashore. And anybody can go to him. And that, that dedicated person ashore can be a junior member of, of the infrastructure. Know nothing about ships, but just a complaints a, or a place to register com your complaint. Register complaint, yeah. yes. Yeah. Where, where, and and they must have the ability to make something happen, right. yeah, or make something not happen. Yeah. I, I should mention something that uh, is is in play in the uh, the legal system in the United States uh, that many many people who are familiar with that uh, region will have known about. Uh, particular incident that's brought it into focus. Uh, I don't know how it applies in other nations, but there's a thing in the U.S. called the Siemens Manslaughter Statute. And uh, the, the best way to illustrate it is the uh, incident involving a uh, Staten Island ferry about 10 years ago that uh, was set up in such a way that uh, it, there was an internal requirement, a policy of the operators of the vessel that when the, the, the vessel was uh, in the process of arriving, uh, maneuvering to, uh, to come into a terminal, there were supposed to be two licensed individuals in the pilot house at the time. And that rule was not being observed. The individual who was at the controls lost consciousness for reasons that I think have been attributed to, to medical problems. Uh, the vessel was out of control. It caught the edge of the pier. Uh, broke the pilings out from under it, and the concrete slab of the pier opened up the side of the vessel like a can opener, and 11 people died, lots and lots of other injuries. And the, re the result of that, not only, well, there were problems with regard to the people on board. The people involved in management of the vessel ashore were made subject to criminal penalties because there were deaths involved. And people involved in management ashore and having responsibility with regard to that rule uh, got criminal convictions, and I think one or more went to jail over the, over the situation. So again, that doesn't, I have no idea whether anything similar to it applies in other nations, but it's a pretty serious concern. It's been mentioned, I've seen it mentioned in a number of contexts because it seems to single out the marine industry as compared to many other industries for uh, exposure to criminal penalties for things that would be viewed as civil negligence in other contexts. But whether we think it's right or wrong, it's running around, it's existing at least in one jurisdiction and apparently in some others, as I see heads nod. So mm -hmm. it's worth thinking about in the context of who is there to answer to for the, uh, the, the, the right thinking or the wrong <coughs> thinking uh, on board the vessel. Bridget Hogan from the Nautical Institute. Uh, corporate manslaughter laws were brought in in the UK, and I think you'll find in most jurisdictions are mirrored in the wake of the Herald of Free Enterprise. Mm. They don't just apply to seafaring in the UK. They apply generally throughout industry. Um, but of course, there is cr criminalization of seafarers around the world, and it is something to bear in mind that even if it isn't your fault that an accident's happened, you can very often be jailed in a different jurisdiction. And there was a case very recently in South Korea where a fishing boat rammed a merchant vessel, but the foreign crew members of the merchant vessel were imprisoned, even though it hadn't been their fault. So, you know, there is a wider responsibility here, and I hope another imperative to keep the ship safe and think beyond your own authority as a master because there are laws out there mm. governing you and sometimes they're not very fairly applied and that, that's, that's something else to consider mm. as you go about your business. Mm. Jonathan. Thank you, Jonathan Cheshire. Um, 
I was, yeah, was going to come back on the corporate manslaughter point as well, and that doesn't just apply to a maritime activity. Um, I think one of the things that um, has been exercising us a bit more in the UK recently is this question of how shoreside control and, and management works. And because a lot of, um, nearly the majority of the organisations are charities, and in, under UK law, that charities, the board of charities have to be unpaid volunteers. Um, certainly there's been a number, one or two um, quite well publicised uh, incidents where it's become obvious that the, the boards of the charities, of the, of the operator, didn't have a clue what was going on on the boat and uh, there were no systems for kind of just checking up on, for example, whether the log had been filled out mm -hmm. and things like that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's uh, quite a worry, particularly Possibly more recently, there's been a proliferation of very small organisations with just one boat, um, uh, quite often started by people that are kind of keen on the boat but not, had not quite so focused on youth work or the sail training aspects. And I think it's something we, you know, as national organisations, we probably need to do a bit more work on um, to, try and make, to try and raise consciousness amongst uh, board members of, of exactly what their responsibilities are. Yeah. And certainly in my experience, the, the phrase corporate manslaughter is actually quite useful in focusing people's minds. <laughs> it has a way of focusing your mind, yeah. yeah. Anybody else? We're pretty much closing in on the end of our time, but we probably could take another one if anybody wants to chime in. Uh, Alf Green from Lewin. Um, we've talked about here uh, the, the vessel um, they chucked a pump in, didn't work. They put a spare one in, didn't work. So um, training and training absolute has to be looked at and, and you have to incorporate that um, in passage plans as well. I'd suggest it, um, it's an embuggerance in time and effort to uh, get all the stuff out and, and prove it works um, and to the point where you need to um, start thinking about going down in your bilges and um, if, if and where you can, get. Yeah, does the hose actually reach that far? And, mm. and or where is the ne nearest power point? And things like that, that you have to train for. And you need a crew to, to take all that on board. As the only engineer on board the ship, it's hard to get the deck officers down underneath. So, you know, but they have to come down because if I'm incapacitated, mm. someone else has to know stuff. So you've got to start thinking about the, the training aspect as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Training and drills and how to make them effective mm -hmm. and stick, you know, because if you're doing something routinely and you have to repeat it because it is necessary to do so, it is, it is very difficult and it addresses your point about complacency as well. Uh, an anecdote, okay, from a, a merchant um, uh, ship, but it, it resonated with what you were just saying about does the hose work? A colleague of mine, he was... Um, in charge of drills on a, on a tanker and it, it, it was a new ship they were very honoured to be on the first voyage of this vessel uh, but it was a sister ship and they came from the other ship and they said uh, the word came from head office you've got to do a fire drill and you've got to do the whole thing you've got to fill the hoses with water and of course this is a huge bother because it's all got to go back again mm -hmm. and it never goes in quite how it came out so there was a bit of a uh, uh, a complaint about this and uh, he challenged them and said why do we have to do it and they said just don't question it do it so they did it very reluctantly and found that the shipyard had found supplied a different hose entirely it looked the same until you unwound it and it didn't reach and they w and he said it wouldn't have been on our list to do because you know it's fine oh look it's there mm. so mm. you know the, all the time you've got to think how can you make these things and for a while, that crew thought, oh, dr drills are useful. Oh, yeah. And then, of mm -hmm. course, you go back into your box and you say, oh, I've just come off watch. Do I have to go and do a drill? So, you know, all the time you're challenged as senior mm -hmm. officers as to how you can um, make these things resonate with people. But I think you're absolutely right. Mix the oil in the water. Get the deck officers down there and get them understanding each other's problems. Good luck to you. Mm. Uh, one more, and then I think we're probably wrapping it up. Uh, small question. Can you yeah. make comparison between the Bolti and the Oscar II? Uh, 
There are the, the two the Asgard? Asgard ships, Asgard two. Was um, I'm not. I'm. I probably can't because I'm not an, uh, familiar enough with the circumstances of the Asgard. You know, I, I paid a lot of attention to the bounty uh, situation and listened to the hearings and all that. Um, what I know about what I don't know about Asgard could fill an inquiry. Um, my the, the extent that I know about it was an engine failure in close quarters and she was driven ashore. Um, maybe others could could give us more information. Oh, I'm thinking. Wait a minute. I'm I'm thinking of Astrid. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. There you go. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> I'm thinking of Astrid. Um, somebody else might be able to do a better job of it than I. Another time. Okay. Yeah. Once yeah. we get on to that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we'll miss lunch. <laughs> yeah. Thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, Andy, thanks very much. That was a very interesting presentation. Gave us lots to think about, and I'm sure we'll carry on discussing it over lunch. And thank, to you. thank you to you also. Thanks, Andy. Thank you.